Honored to be joined by Roddy Jones of the ACC Network. And Roddy, I feel like when we talk about the ACC lately, it's either DJ Burns and, and NC State, <laughs> who you know is a force of nature, yeah. or schools in the ACC suing the ACC and the ACC suing them back. I would like to talk about actual football on the field in the ACC. So Hopefully, uh, you can help me with that because uh, we, we got a Clemson spring game, NC State spring game this week. We got uh, Florida State in spring practice, Miami. This feels like a very interesting year coming up in the ACC, not to mention adding SMU and Stanford and, and Cal. But, I, Roddy, I, let, let's – can we start with the Tigers? Like, Dabo's got the spring game coming. They've got a super talented roster but can they break back into the club this year? I think they can. The question is, will they? Uh, and and the, the thing, Andy, is like nationally, we've sort of we, we've downgraded Clemson, and I and I think rightfully so. Like if they were a bond, they were the highest rated bond possible for so many years. Them in Alabama, uh, they've taken a step back from that. Some of that's been their hesitance to jump into the transfer portal. Some of it's just been the the quarterback luck ran out some of it's been the receiver luck ran out uh, but this is still a really talented roster the thing is their margin for error is just a lot smaller and if you go back and, and watch the games last year the turnovers that they had came at crucial times I mean in the Duke game first game of the year they fumble inside the red zone twice uh two times that they likely would have scored or at least gotten points uh, and they end up losing that game against Florida State. They're up seven and driving when Cade Klubnik gets sacked. Kalen Delone mm -hmm. scoops and scores. It's a 14-point uh, swing there. So there's a lot of games where you could point to and say Clemson was right there. My question to Dabo Sweeney would be, what have you done this offseason to make sure that those mistakes don't put you on the wrong side of that margin for error? Because they are close. They're extremely talented. They'll be probably the most talented roster in the league again, uh, if not, you know, top two so, so if K Klubnik takes a step in development, if that receiver room as a whole takes a step in development, if Phil Moffa can fill the shoes of, of both he and Will Shipley last year, then I think they've got a real shot. They've got some big names to replace on defense, but that defense is always good. It's always super talented, and they've got some great players up front. So, so I think I think they can. Uh, they just got to eliminate the major mistakes. Well, P Peter Woods is a guy that I, I'm surprised isn't a household name yet, but. I think he will be. I mean, it, he sort of follows in that long line of Grady Jarrett, Christian Wilkins, Brian Bercia. Now, I realize these are all very different kinds of defensive tackles, but they're all Dexter Lawrence, all really good, dominant interior D linemen. So Clemson still has that. But I, I go back to, like, Kate Klubnick talking at the beginning of spring practice about how they had times last year where they'd have receivers where they're running this particular route in a game for the first time, like where they didn't rep it in practice, yeah. but but somebody got hurt. And can they finally get back to the the kind of receiver depth that they used to have? That's I guess that's my question. Cause like I, I think back to you know whether it was was T. Higgins and Amari Rogers or uh Mike Williams and, and Hunter Renfro and Artavis Scott, like they they just have not had multiple guys that scare you. The, the answer is is no. They're not going to get back to that. The attrition's been too high. That's been the position the most where I think their hesitance to go into the transfer portal has hurt them because they've had guys the, – the, the inputs have been the same, Andy. You know, T. Higgins was mm -hmm. a four-star guy. Uh, uh, Mike Williams was a four- or five-star guy. You know, they, they've been getting four- and five-stars. Bo and Dakari Collins, five-star – or four-star players. E.J. Williams, a four-star player. The inputs have been the same. The output's what's changed – and, and then the attrition as well, guys playing for three years or sitting for three years and then transferring out, those guys don't develop like a Cornell Powell who took really until his fourth and fifth year to become a really good receiver for him. So they're not going to build that kind of depth. My, my question is, like, can they get the top end talent again? Uh, and, and every single year for it seems like forever – uh, we've heard about a freshman receiver, whether it was, you know, Frank Ladson and Joseph Ngata or the Dakari Collins, Bo Collins, EJ Wood. We've heard about them. They've got another one, a highly touted freshman receiver coming in who's lighting it up in spring practice. Can he turn into that guy? I I'm skeptical at this point. I'm skeptical. But if they can sort of have depth by committee, like if they can not have a drop off from, you know, from Troy Stellato, for example, to the next guy, then then I think you can sort of find a happy medium between what they were and what they've been. 
Yeah, Bry- Bryant Wesco, the the receiver you're talking about, the, the yeah. freshman that you know, I, and you wonder like, will they have another one blow up? But it, I, I'm I'm with you on that. The the portal piece of it, and I said this after the Florida State game last year, and, and Clemson fans got mad at me. So I, I said, you know, if Keon Coleman transfers to Clemson instead of Florida State, and obviously Clemson wasn't in the mix for him. That you know, he he was looking at particular schools. But let's say they had been like, hey, come here. They win the game. Like, that's yeah. the difference. I, I don't feel like yeah. they're that far off, but it's it, this unwillingness to to bring in somebody new just it baffles me. And, and the, I mean, the, the, Keon Coleman's a great example because that one was right in front of him, but there's so many. I mean, look at what A.D. Mitchell did at Texas. He was at Georgia. So, you know, yeah. if, you, if you just go down the road to Athens and start to recruit that guy, then maybe get him in. The thing that alarms me about Clemson now, Andy, is, is they've started to dip into it in terms of recruiting guys particularly in the offensive line, and they haven't been good at it. So the speed dating of the transfer portal, Clemson hasn't adjusted to. They went after reportedly like five offensive linemen. None of them chose Clemson. It's developmental relationship type recruiting that they're very good at, and they're very good at it at the high school level. But it feels like the speed dating uh, of the portal, they haven't quite adjusted to. Yeah, it it, it is tough. Uh, and it, meanwhile, you, you've got Florida State, which mastered it. Like Florida State's going to be a very different looking team this year. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on this because it feels like there's been a little like before this, there was the developmental piece of it where Mike Norvell taking what he inherited and and building that up, but also adding these pieces in. And maybe it was Jamie Robinson or Jaheim Bell, who they got from South Carolina. Uh, Keon Coleman, we mentioned this year. It seems like they went very specifically dudes at Alabama and Georgia (laughs) who may or may not have been able to win starting jobs in the spring. And that uncertainty is what led them into the portal. It feels like the pipeline of, of Georgia defensive linemen that's going to be a rotational piece to Florida State is strong after Jermaine Johnson. Jermaine Johnson, yeah. Sitting, out, sitting behind like three first rounders. He comes in, he's the first rounder at Florida State. Now Marvin Jones Jr., Florida State legacy, chose to go to Georgia, goes to Florida State, and they're going to look to sort of microwave that same sort of success. But Florida State has done such a good job of, of, as you said, there were two pieces to it. On the offensive line, they brought in transfer portal guys from lower level schools and developed. And in a lot of positions, they sort of took that, uh, took took that 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 approach. Look at Fabian Lovett on the defensive line, who was yeah. a multi year contributor for. I don't even think of State. him as a transfer because he was there for like four years. Exactly, exactly. And a lot of those offensive linemen that we saw play last year. Were, were like three-year guys, guys that had transferred from lower schools like three years ago and were developmental pieces. So um, n- now they're at the point where they've got the depth, they've got the foundation, and you're just looking for high-level guys that can impact you immediately. Um, they've had so much success. There's no reason to think it won't, it won't uh, continue this year. It is going to look significantly different, though, Andy, and that kind of leads me to like I don't know exactly what their ceiling is, um, and we probably won't know for the first couple of games, honestly. Yeah, that's I, we, we had DJU on the show and, and I thought, man, this guy fits in here. Great. You know, you talk to people around the program and they're so happy with him. But you have no idea what that's going to look like. <laughs> like right. it's a, yeah. we know what the Jordan Travis version of Florida State looks like because we've seen it for so long. But yeah, now, speaking of, of new quarterback, new face, new place. So NC State has their spring game this weekend. Grayson McCall, longtime Coastal Carolina quarterback, steps in with the Wolfpack. No Peyton Wilson on the other side of the ball anymore. But I, I don't know about you. I, I feel like there's like a, a little arrested development. There's always money in the banana stand on their defense. <laughs> like it is going yeah. to be good. Yeah. And then can can the offense come around? The offense was what held them back last year, the quarterback position in particular. And I think Grayson McCall going to NC State is one of the least talked about giant transfers in the country. I mean, this is a guy that was an absolute baller at Coastal Carolina, multi-time player of the year in that conference. I mean, he captured our hearts and minds that team did a few years ago in 2020. Um, and, and and I don't want to be hyperbolic here, but it feels like he's got a shot to be the best quarterback they've had at NC State since Russell Wilson. I mean, and they've had some good ones. Ben Finley was good. Jacoby Brissett was good. Devin Leary gave them some good years. But, like, Grayson McCall's a dude. Uh, so you pair him with Casey Concepcion, who was basically that offense last year. Jordan Waters, who's a really good running back from Duke, transfers over as well. 
and, and and as you said, like there's always money on that defense. They have gone through multiple iterations of turning over that defense since they got really good in 2019, 2020. Uh, and so now that defense has to sort of enter a new era, Peyton Wilson less era. But over the course of the last five years, they've had to play multiple chunks of seasons without Peyton Wilson and still been excellent. So so Tony Gibson's one of the absolute best. The fact that they still have him at NC State, I think, is a, not a minor miracle, but it's a great job by NC State of supporting him. So if you're going to take a flyer, I mean, it's, it's, it's April, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but if you're going to take a flyer on a team, NC State's not a bad one. It's the year of the Wolfpack, too. They got two teams in the Final Four. They've broken the curse. Exactly. Well, and, and you know, I think that Tennessee-NC State game in Charlotte is really intriguing at the be- for both teams at the beginning of the season because you, you don't know what Tennessee is going to be like with Nico at quarterback, and that's their, their first real challenge. And then you get to see Grayson McCall against maybe the best D-line they're going to face. Yeah. which is saying something, but that's how good Tennessee's D-line is this year. But the, the Casey Concepcion thing is crazy to me because you're right. When, when you say he was their offense, as a freshman, 71 catches. The next highest number of receptions on the team, 28. Yeah. yeah. This was a and, team that struck. And, and look, the MJ Morris thing was, it was all weird. All of it was weird because they recruited over him, brought somebody in from the transfer portal, uh, and then he plays the four games. And he's like, wait a second. If you're going to recruit over me, I'm, I'm going to go find my own thing. And now he's at Maryland. I think that all of the, the, the mismanagement of the quarterback situation last year is what killed them. Yeah, if, if Grayson McCall is that dude from the get-go, you're talking about a pretty good team here. You're talking about a really good team. I, I do think if you're looking for the silver lining uh, behind the, the quarterback situation that they had, I thought the culture of that team, that program really – shine during that time it's, it's really easy for a team when you have a guy that you believed in in mj morris who gets recruited over by brandon armstrong brandon armstrong doesn't play well they are struggling on offense you go to mj morris and then he steps back and says hey look i want to actually redshirt so that i can go do my thing then brandon armstrong comes back in i i, I thought through all of that the culture of nc state and the fact that that team stayed together and had a chance a chance to win its 10th game in the bowl game against Kansas State, I, I thought that was a testament to Dave Doran. Um, and, and they won't have that this year. Like, they won't have that distraction in the quarterback position. You're going to get the ultimate leader, the ultimate competitor in Grayson McCall. Uh, and they've got some playmakers. They've got some talent on the offensive line. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time not getting excited about that. Well, and so the other team that I've been kind of excited about, and I've had people say, hey, Cool your jets on on this team. So I, I need you as an arbiter here. I look at what Louisville did last year, which we said going into the season, their schedule was favorable mm-hmm. and they, they had a chance to do some things. But I think Jeff Brom with another year to build the roster up and, and look, he did a really good job because like, you know, you look at the way Isaac Garendo is testing <laughs> in the in the combine and the in pro day, like he found some good players and but I'm looking at Tyler Shuck as he comes to Louisville. And it feels like, you know, at Oregon, at Texas Tech, it wasn't like Tyler Shuck was ever bad. It was he was good and then he was hurt. And I, I keep saying, and I, I realize this is probably an unfair comparison, but Michael Penix Jr. at Indiana, where he was either good or he was hurt. And then when you finally saw him be healthy for a while, he was awesome. Now he's, you know, you got Tyler Shook with a quarterback whisperer in Jeff Brom. Could he stay healthy? Could he be good for a whole season? Like it, that, that intrigues me a lot. It it intrigues me too, because the flashes of Tyler Shook that we've seen give him a higher ceiling than what Jack Plummer gave them. And, and, you know, towards the end of the year, that, that that offense was so up and down. It, It seemed like early in the year, if they couldn't create big plays, they weren't scoring. And then late in the year when it sort of dried up and Isaac Garendo took over, uh, until they hit Florida State, they were able to just sort of manage um, to manage the game, hold the ball. But but I think Tyler Shuck gives them a a higher ceiling than what Jack Plummer did a year ago. The questions to me are are that offense was able to congeal pretty quickly. Jack Plummer had played in the offense again. They got the big plays from Jawar Jordan uh, early on and Jamari Thrash. Can it congeal as quickly this season? And I think that's sort of the question that we always have with the transfer portal. As you said, Jeff Brom's had success with all of his quarterbacks. It feels like 
his the most success that he has comes with older quarterbacks. Aiden O'Connell in his last couple seasons. Obviously, mm-hmm. Jack Plummer was an older guy. Tyler Shuck's what twenty five. So, so you're yeah. going to have an older quarterback that's going to take what 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 Jeff Brom designs isn't gonna isn't going to get tired with completions, um, which is all you need. That defense is going to be really good. That defense was really good last year, and it should be really good again this year. Yeah, that's it, that one. I don't think they're going to surprise anybody this year, though. Everybody's going to come in expecting Louisville to be good, so they they, they don't have that element anymore. But one other ACC team I wanted to ask you about this one. We just, I feel like I can never accurately predict Miami. I, I don't it's know impossible. what Miami is. It. Like, I, I suspect they're more talented this year. I suspect that offensive line is taking a step forward again this year. Uh, it feels like they brought in some, some really good players on the D line, but we don't know how long it'll take them to develop. But then things like the Georgia Tech game happen. And it's like, mm-hmm. can, can they ever get over the hump? If they can figure out the operational stuff, the communication on the coaching staff to make sure that the that the fatal flaw, the massive mistake doesn't happen. The Georgia Tech game uh, is a big one, but there's also I can't remember what game it was now because it all blends together. But there's multiple games where they go into the locker room with three timeouts at the end of the first half or at the end of the game. You're like, what are we doing? We could have used one of those timeouts at some point to try and extend the game to try and get our defense set. So, so they can figure that stuff out, then they'll get out of the way of showing how much that roster has improved from a talent standpoint, in particular on the two places that you mentioned, the offensive and defensive lines. If you go back and you watch that Florida State game, for most of the first half, that offensive line did a really, really good job against Florida State's defensive line, and it was really young and inexperienced uh, at spots, particularly to tackle spots. But, but if they're able to replace Matt Lee – the, the excellent job they've done recruiting on the offensive line should be able to show Mark Fletcher's back at running back. And then you've got Cam Ward at quarterback, a guy that was asked to play hero ball at Washington State. He should have more support around him uh, in terms of a run game and an offensive line than he did at Washington State. Uh, and then you expect the defense to take a step forward because, as you said, on that defensive line, they both they have Reuben Bain, who is an absolute monster. Right. He should be, you know, one of the best, if not the best players in the league. But the depth that they've developed or the depth that they recruited and brought in on the transfer portal around him should improve them. So I, I, I think Miami should be really good. I really do. And, and I'm, I'm, I'll go out on the land and say, hey, look, Miami should be a team that's flirting with double digit wins. Because you've got the quarterback, you recruit well on the offensive and defensive lines. I think their offensive skills should be good enough. I think their defensive skills should be good enough. Uh, the question is, can you put it all together? And that's been the question for the last, what, two decades with Miami? Yeah, exactly. And the, the Cam Ward thing is interesting to me because, like, like you mentioned, a little bit of hero ball at Washington State. He's going to be surrounded by more talent here. So he shouldn't have to do everything himself. And also, Shannon Dawson, their OC, runs an offense – very similar to yeah. what he's accustomed to. Like they speak the same language. It should be fairly easy for Cam Ward to come in and adjust to this. I, th- I do wonder how much of it is, you know, for Miami, just having the right guy at quarterback. Cause it felt like Tyler Van Dyke might be. And then the coaching change happened and then it didn't, it didn't work out for him. He's at Wisconsin now, yeah. uh, but could it be Cam Ward or, or even Emory Williams at some point down the road? Yeah, I, I think I think the quarterback position is a big part of it um, because I mentioned that Florida State game. Eventually, Florida State found out that not only could Miami not throw the ball, they weren't even really going to try to throw the ball. And once yeah. they made that adjustment, you know, it was sort of game over for them moving the ball consistently offensively. It created a couple of big plays later on. But 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 I, I think that the quarterback position is a huge one because let's not forget Tyler Van Dyke also had that really weird injury where mm-hmm. the skin was separating from the fat underneath like his leg and it was causing him extreme Ugh. pain. I, I can't remember what it was called, but it sounded like it hurt really, really bad. And so yeah. he was dealing with stuff as well. So um, Cam Ward is a is a better, more talented option for them at quarterback. As you mentioned, the system, you know, going from Incarnate Word to Washington State, Shannon Dawson coming from that air raid tree, you said it, they speak the same language. I do think – uh, the offense will be structured much differently from a philosophical standpoint than it was at either of those two. They're going to want to run the ball. They're going to want to run the yeah. ball downhill. And I think that can really help Cam Ward. Yeah, because he doesn't have to be the guy holding up the offense on every single play. Yeah, exactly. he, he, he can 
he can have one or two where, where the lion and the backs take over and, and do their thing. So, uh, Roddy, I, I'm really excited now. And, uh, folks, the, the NC State stuff, put a pin in that. Yeah. Because I, we, we've met, we, we had a deep dive into Tennessee a couple weeks ago, Roddy, and we talked a lot about that NC State game. And I think, you know, you look at the Wolfpack schedule, you look at, at what they have coming in, that might be your dark horse for the ACC title game. And I, I, I'm very interested because you, you wonder if, like, how, how long can Dave Dorn and company consistently be good before they do finally break through? Because they've been right. kind of right there. They, they've been they've been right there. I'm also I know, I know we're talking ACC. I am sneaky excited about Tennessee, so I'm glad we brought them up a couple of times. Yes, what they, I think you mentioned the defensive line, but but with Nico at quarterback, like you're going to get better than Joe Milton. I don't know if he'll be Hendon Hooker. He probably mm -hmm. more dynamic on the top end. I'm excited about Tennessee. I'm I'm really fascinated with that game. Uh, but but as you mentioned, like with NC State. The, the defense is, is going to be there. The offense certainly, uh, you know, has to take a step forward in terms of consistency. So that's a week one game uh, to, to really circle. All right, Roddy Jones, thank you so much. Appreciate it, Andy. Always good to catch up. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On3Sports YouTube channel.